Something could happen on this show. You never can tell. <laughs> How you doing, everybody? Uh, hope everybody's staying healthy and safe. Uh, Joe Farina here. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Show. I'm Joe, and this is... Pam. I'm Pam. <laughs> <laughs> great to see you, Pam. How you been? I've been great, Joe. Thanks so much for, you know, being here. And I just want to welcome everybody. And we've got a really special guest today. You're going to love hearing about some of the early, early rock and roll days. Absolutely. We, we are uh, thrilled. We are absolutely thrilled and honored uh, to be joined by um, author, musician, all around talented person. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor and our pleasure to welcome Bill Haley Jr. Bill, how are you? And welcome to our show. Hi, Joe. Pam, how are you guys doing? We're doing better now that you're here, Bill. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Oh, you're very welcome. You're Our quite pleasure. Welcome. Pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for 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 joining us. And uh, the first question that I have that I have for you is: um, you you have a famous father. You had a famous father, as did I. I grew up. Uh, my father was the late Dennis Farina, and through through throughout my life, um, every now and then I would get asked, um, you know what. You know, what was it like growing up uh, with a famous father? What, because to a lot of people, that's just, you know, to us, maybe it's just kind of an or, you know, everyday life kind of thing. But to fans and people outside of the, of the family, you know, it's a, wow, that's a pretty big deal. It's, a, you know, what was it like? And I wanted to ask you, um, uh, what was it like growing up uh, with a famous father? And how, and how did you balance um honoring your father's leg, uh, legacy, but at the same time, uh, developing in, your own craft and your own career as well. Well, gosh, Joe, I could take the whole show to explain. <laughs> you, uh, That's my master plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, I think it's probably different for every offspring of every famous person. It's different depending on their circumstances. And just like every family is different, um, those circumstances are different for them as well. So. In my case, unfortunately, um, and I don't know your situation at all, but, but unfortunately in my case, it, um, it's, it's not a happy story. My father um, was, uh, was always on the road when I was a child. And, um, and when I was just barely eight years old, the marriage ended and my father moved to Mexico. And really, so I had no real personal relationship with my father to speak of up until the last couple of years of his life. He died in 1981. And uh, that, those were pretty tragic circumstances, too, as well as the, uh, the difficulties I had trying to communicate. But to just try to answer your question succinctly, um, it was very challenging for me because um, people would meet me. And of course, I had my father's name. I'm Bill Haley, Jr., and now it's 75 years ago when those hits were big. So it's not so much now, but when I was a child in the 60s and 70s growing up, Bill Haley was still a household name. Um, so there was an immediate assumption that I had this wonderful life with a rich, famous father and everything was great, but it was nothing of the sort. So, um, so um, I had to kind of reconcile people's expectations with the reality and um, and I had to work through my, my, uh, my personal issues with my disappointment of my father and my lack of a relationship with my father. So it made it all difficult for me. But frankly, Joe, the way I dealt with it was um, really starting in my college days and, and, and um, over a period of about 40 years, I researched my father's life and ultimately wrote a, a book and had it published. It's published now uh, on Backbeat Books in North America, Omnibus Books, globally and then based in the UK. Um, but it took me 40 years to really kind of do the research, write that book. But it, it was, you know, uh, the purpose was to write a book about my father, the inside story. But it was also a journey of me trying to discover who my father was as a person and kind of sure. reconcile all uh, what happened in our personal lives with that. So so it's been a lifelong challenge being the son of a famous person. And, and uh, Joe, as, as you may know, um, People who don't know you just look at you as an extension of that person initially. 
And that's, you know, it, that's natural. And you kind of, we all kind of think that way. So you have to overcome that with people. But of course, once people get to know you, you're just a person like everybody else. Sure. But, um, but I just had to work through my own personal issues over my father's disappointment more than anything. Um, but but uh, I would say, uh, I don't know that I got any benefit from it, except maybe it possibly opened some doors here and there. Who knows? Um, but, um, but believe me, the other side of it was there was a lot of uh, psychological, emotional baggage to work through dealing with that. Well, it seems like you've come far. Um, not only have you come to terms with your father, uh, his fame and so forth, you've embraced his music and you're perpetuating his legacy with the fabulous music that you're playing. Uh, I was watching some of your videos and you very, your band is just amazing. Um, the musicality, I mean, the, the musicianship is incredible. And uh, you, you've got that sound, you've got your father's sound in, in there. You know, it's like, almost like hearing your dad, you know, it's pretty, it's really great. Well, thank you for that, Pam. Um, you know, I guess um, my father did not leave me much, but he did leave me uh, his vocal cords, or at least, you know, something close to that. So I can <laughs> sing like him pretty well. And, and I've always had music in me. And even as a teenager, I picked up the guitar, taught myself to play, and I just loved music and I wrote songs. But I was always intimidated, of course, by the, uh, you know, my father's fame um, and my own issues I alluded to earlier. So I never went into music professionally. I, I, mm -hmm. I uh, developed a career in journalism. Got a degree in journalism from Temple University, ended up uh, uh, starting a business magazine and really did that as my vocation my whole life. However, um, about 10, 12 years ago, um, one thing led to another and I had an opportunity to go into a studio and record some of my original songs with a little local garage band I played in for fun. And um, we did a CD release party and one thing led to another, the hosts of the party in a retail store in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, asked if I would do some of my dad's tunes. And I always did them for fun anyway, because I, I could sing like my dad. And uh, somebody took out a cell phone and recorded us doing Rock Around the Clock, put it on YouTube. I ended up getting a call from a booking agent in Florida who specializes in 1950s music, mm. uh, Wolfman Jack Entertainment. And uh, basically he made me an offer I couldn't refuse, which was put together a band that could play this music at a high professional level and he could uh, create some opportunities for me. So I, I took it the next level. I, not only did I find the right musicians who had a strong interest in this period of music and who were exceptionally talented, um, but we developed a rock and roll history show. So it was more than just going out and playing my dad's music. I'd go out and tell the story of, of course, my father was the first rock and roll star, uh, predated all the other pioneers of rock and roll. So we tell that story. A lot of, in Europe, in England, they kind of know the story. Here in the U.S., not so much. Most people think uh, Elvis was the first rock and roll star. So we tell the story of Bill Haley and the Salomon, Bill Haley and the Comets, the early days of rock and roll, um, with little anecdotes, and uh, set up each song, and then perform the songs, and then we uh, show some photographs through a PowerPoint presentation, and kind of make it a, uh, a, a rock and roll history show. So. Uh, thank you for the compliment on that the sense. We really worked hard to get the sound to be authentic, but we also uh, worked hard to really kind of come up with some unique uh, and interesting stories so that people come away from the show not only feeling entertained, but also uh, like they learned something about the early days of rock and roll. Well, your journalism background is paying off in that sure. regard. <laughs> sure, sure, that helped tremendously. Yeah. The, the way you pay homage uh, to your father's music and legacy, uh, legacy is, is really sensational. You so and you should pat yourself on the back for, for how, you've been, how you've been doing it. And I did want to ask you, what I mean, there's so many legendary uh, and historical uh, aspects of your, your father's life and his, his career. I was wondering if you can touch base on, on this specifically. What you, your father sounded was so unique, and you mentioned he was really, you know, when you really dissected the first uh, rock and roll star. And the, when I first listened uh, to your father's music, I can hear you get. I can hear you know rhythm and blues, and I can also hear uh, country. And I was wondering if you could tell our uh, viewers and our and our listeners about your father's path on combining those two, and then 
becoming the uh, the legend that that he became. Sure, absolutely, and that, and it, it really is fascinating to me. You know, my dad started out um, as uh, he grew up in in southeastern Pennsylvania, which would you wouldn't think of as a um, a, a hotbed of, of what we now call country music. But back then it was called hillbilly and western music and it was really kind of, you know, throughout the country there were followers. So in southeastern Pennsylvania, where there's a lot of rural area, uh, in Delaware County, uh, my father grew up listening to hillbilly and western music and he loved it. And, um, and uh, my father, uh, you may or may not know, um, he's blind, was blind in one of his left eye um, yeah. from a, um, he had a, a botched operation for a mastoid infection at the age of four oh. and blind in his left eye. So as a child, he was a little self-conscious about his eyes. So one of his escape mechanisms was to become a singing cowboy, wear a big cowboy hat. Um, and that was the motivation for doing it. And he loved music. His father played the banjo and mandolin. His mother played the organ at church and, and, and was uh, uh, a, p a pianist, classically trained. So he had music in his blood. His parents encouraged him. They bought him a guitar at the age of 13. And he wanted to become a the next Gene Autry. And then, of course, you know, some later of the hillbilly stars, but he really, uh, that was, his, that was his, his goal, his vocation. So that's where he started as a teenager, he went out on the road and, and uh, formed a few bands, joined a few bands. Um, and then back in those days, a lot of those hillbilly and western bands would, would work on radio stations. So he would work at various radio stations as the house band, play in the clubs at night. Eventually he became a disc jockey himself. So he almost had a full career by, by, by 19, 49, he was 24 years old, was a disc jockey at WPWA in Chester, Pennsylvania. And he, he, his band called the Four Aces of Western Swing had just broken up. And uh, he was kind of uh, determined to just be a disc jockey the rest of his life. Hmm. But he still loved music. But a couple of guys came in to see him at a little place called Luke's Musical Bar in Chester, Pennsylvania. Um, out of work musicians who had just finished a job. Billy Williamson, a steel guitar player, Johnny Grandy, an accordionist and pianist. And they had heard about Bill Haley, they kind of knew him, and they knew that he was interested in, 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 in trying to create some new sounds they had heard. So they went and they talked to him, and, and basically they, they hashed it out and agreed to start a new band with the intention of coming up with a new music that would get kids wow. dancing again. The big band aid uh, era was gone. Kids were no longer dancing. The hit songs were, were you know, a song from the Moulin Rouge by Percy Faith and his orchestra and How Much Is That Doggy in the Window were, you know, that was, that was pop music. So they decided they were going to form a band to get kids dancing again. Now, they were hillbilly and Western artists, so they called themselves the Salomon and they started playing on the radio and getting gigs, but they would experiment. Every day they would take two hours where they would start listening to what we now call rhythm and blues records, Back then they were called race records, mm -hmm. but even before that, the Count Basie records, but they were listening, trying to come up with a sound and trying to integrate different sounds into their hillbilly sound. And that's really how it started as an experiment. At a certain point, they came to the realization that by accentuating the two and the four beat, you added energy to the music and you got mm -hmm. people interested in dancing. So what they started doing was at the twin bars in Gloucester was just as a joke initially, started throwing in a couple of these race records or rhythm and blues songs and one of them was called rock the joint so in 1950 the twin bars as a joke they played rock the joint it was a, a, actually um by jimmy preston and his prestonians it was released on the gotham label out of philadelphia 1949 it's a local hit and actually on my father's radio station where he was a disc jockey there was a one-hour show of race records which is how they termed it. And the theme song was Rock the Joint. And my dad would hear it every day. It got in his head. He loved it. So as a joke one night at the Twin Bars, he turned to the guys and said, let's do that tune, thinking everybody would laugh and leave. Instead, they all jumped out of their chairs, started dancing, hooting and hollering. And next thing you know, they're, they're asking for that Rock the Joint tune. So that was the, that was the, the genesis of it. And that's something. So that was 1950. So now over the next three years or so they were experimenting they made various records with on the a side was a hillbilly tune on the b side was a rhythm and blues influenced tune mm -hmm. then in 1953 well actually well i'll back up a little bit 1952 they took on a manager who had the idea you know what if you want to sell records it's not going to be to the sailors going to the bar twin bars from the philadelphia navy yard it's going to be teenagers 
So he suggested that the saddlemen go out and do record hops, assemblies, high school gatherings for free as an experiment to see what the kids wanted. So they played 183 high schools in the Philadelphia area. Wow, that's a lot of and, free and work. And they would watch those kids, that's right, and they would see the toes tap and the shoulders move and they knew something was worth keeping. So at one point, they were wrapping up their show, putting the instruments in the car, and some of the kids came up to them. And, and, and uh, I, I always describe it as the tall kid with the ducktail haircut and the, uh, the, the brown and tan suede bucks, and he was snapping his fingers. And he said, uh, my, my dad said, well, what do you think of our music? And the kid said, like, crazy, man, crazy. <laughs> my brother was probably a beatnik, of course. <laughs> but my dad was struck by that. He wrote that phrase down, went back uh, to the apartment in Broomall where, where uh, my mother and, and he were living. And he wrote a tune called Crazy Man Crazy about a mythical band that keeps kids dancing all night. <laughs> Recorded it the next day, and this, it was released, and lo and behold, it became a national hit record in 1953, with the number 11 in cash box number 13 on Billboard. And uh, it, it shook up the music world. Uh, there were three major record labels, Capital, RCA, and DECA, and, and uh, they had a stranglehold on the radio stations. But when they heard Crazy Man Crazy saw what was happening, all of a sudden there was a realization that there's something brewing out there. So that led to a, a, a deal with Decca Records in New York and Milk Gabler, who was a legendary producer of jazz artists. Uh, he had just finished a, a, a stint producing Louis Jordan and his Timpani Five, which was a, a rhythm and blues mm -hmm. dance band in the late 40s, early 50s. And so he, uh, under his uh, tutelage, um, the Comets, who had changed their name after Crazy Man Crazy was a hit, from Saddleman to Comets, Got rid of the cowboy hats, shaved the sideburns, got rid of the boots, put on the suits and tuxedos, became the Comets. And um, under the tutelage of Milk Gabler at Decca Records, they started producing hit records. Um, and now, Joe, to circle back, just to answer your question, I know I got, I got off track here. I That's okay. but, but, but so, so, so you're absolutely right. Those first two influences are, were, are predominant in my father's sound, country and western or hillbilly rhythm and blues. However, what makes my father truly unique and different than all the other pioneers of rock and roll that followed, which are basically a combination of those two elements, was that my father went into those studios and they use studio musicians from the big band jazz field. Drummer Billy Gusek, saxophone player initially, um, the guitar player, the guitar player, Danny Cedrone from the Esquire Boys. So, they, so it was really three influences that came together. Hmm. Country and Western, rhythm and blues, and big band jazz swing wow. sounds. All three came together to create the Haley sound, which made it kind of unique and different, and which explains why it's really kind of predates all the sun sound out of, you know, sun records, oh, yeah. um, which was basically just country boys playing rhythm and blues music. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, different variations down in Atlanta, you had Little Richard, uh, Chuck Berry in St. Louis, you know, um, but, but once again, the combination was rhythm and blues and country to some extent, or pure rhythm and blues that made up early rock and roll. But my dad was really predated those guys. He mixed those two. But the genius of, not genius, I'll just say the, the, um, uh, the creative decision to bring in the best musicians possible from the jazz swing field also contributed to that unique sound that produced those early mega hit records, including Rock Around the Clock, which became the first number one record in rock and roll, really is seen as the demarcation point and that opened the floodgates. That's right. Of rock and roll to, to popular mm -hmm. people. Now, if you have time, I'll just give you a little quick story on that one record. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so they got the deal with Decca Records. Okay, and this was April of 1954 was the first recording session. They were late to get there because they got stuck on a sandbar riding the ferry across the Delaware River. They didn't have cell phones in those days, so they were already two hours late getting to the studio. They finally got there in New York. Their first session with Decca, Milk Gabler says, okay, the song I want you to do is called 13 Women and Only One Man in Town. They never heard of it. They spent all day practicing it. They did seven takes, because back in those days, there were no overdubs. It was everybody play it together, and if you, get, if you make a mistake, do it again. Took seven tries. Finally, they got it done. They've got 40 minutes left. They've got to get out of the studio. On the B side, Gabler says, what do you want to do? They said, well, we had this tune called We're Going to Rock Around the Clock. <laughs> they did two takes. Boom, they're out of there. 
Oh my goodness. Okay. Now, <laughs> 13 women came out, went to number 26, and then it dropped. Okay. And that could have been the end of Rock Around the Clock. They went back in the studio, they recorded the tune called Shake, Rattle, and Roll. It was a mega hit, it sold 3 million records. Later that year, they had a couple of more hits, but that first day was almost forgotten, except for out in California, there was a youngster by the name of Peter Ford, whose dad was starring in a movie about juvenile delinquency. His dad, Glenn Ford, was starring in a movie called The Blackboard Jungle. Yes. And uh, the producer, uh, director, Richard Brooks, would come over to the Ford's home and, and go over lines. And at one point he said to Glenn, he said, you know, we're looking for a song to use on the soundtrack of this movie that would be appropriate. It's a highly controversial subject and, you know, and Glenn said, well, my son Peter's a big music fan. Why don't you come over to, and let's go through a record collection. So you can guess the story. They chose three records. One of them was Rock Around the Clock. Ultimately, that was the record they chose to use. So almost a year after it was recorded and almost forgotten as a B-side of a record, it was re-released when it came out on the soundtrack of Blackboard Jungle in March of 55. By July of 55, it was the first number one record in rock and roll history. And they, of course, they called it a foxtrot with vocal chorus on the label. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't you know, rock oh. and roll, they didn't know what to call it yet. Um, but to this day, um, the last I checked, it's still, according to Guinness Book of World Records, the third best-selling single of all time after... Ben Crosby's White Christmas and John's second crack at candle in the wind. What a great story. Oh, that, that's I incredible. Mean, that's just, that's magnificent. <laughs> and when you hear oh, that wow. song, I don't know what it is. Man, it just grabs you. Yes. And I even had, I interviewed uh, a man named Willie Garcia out in, um, he's from the Whittier, um, Whittier Street. Oh gosh, I can't think of it. Um, little Willie G. And he <laughs> talked about when he got into music, he lives out in California. Right. And he said, when he went to the movie theater, and he said, all of a sudden, this song comes on and everybody is like, what is that? And he said, that was what got him into music. And how many other people did that touch? It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, there's no, yeah. no doubt about it. There's a lot of stories like that. And, and um, of course, that was the theme song for Happy Days too, right? Correct, correct. So it really had a second life. It really was re-erected. I'm thinking two or three times it charted, you know, since the original, uh, uh, you know, uh, position on the charts, I think in the early 70s. Uh, I think once again, in the mid 70s, once again, it charted. And then, of course, it, it charted in different countries around the world. I think it went to number one in Australia in the 70s. So, yeah, it keeps coming back. But the whole, that whole rock and roll revival, Happy Days and American Graffiti really gave it new legs. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's just a song that just um, has this magical quality to it that just uh, makes really it time. Yeah. Speaking wow. of the South Pacific, I hear you were down in New Zealand touring not, not long ago. We did. I, well, that was 2014. It's a little long ago oh, now. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, that was very, uh, that, was, that, was, um, that was an unexpected surprise and, and it was a wonderful experience where we, we uh, I think we did a 13 city tour of New Zealand over three and a half weeks and um, and uh, we knocked them dead. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> that's it was great. great. They loved us, and, and of course, we loved them as well. Yeah. So, oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. What are uh, what are some of your uh, future plans? I know we have the COVID uh, going on and everything, and everybody's right, trying to right. adjust uh, the best uh, that they can. But it sounds like uh, you're continuing uh, uh, with your band uh, whenever uh, you can uh, can do that. And tell us. Uh, outside of the band, what else do you do? You mem uh, mentioned uh, uh, business magazine or publishing. Tell us a little yeah. bit more about that as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I still do that. I publish a B2B magazine. It's a regional magazine in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's nothing exciting about it, but it, it pays the bills, keeps the lights on. Um, and so, so, yeah, the band is the other thing. And, and then related to the band, the book, and there are several projects related to, to, to those, which, as you alluded to, everything kind of got on hold this year. So, so we had a number of, of gigs lined up, which fortunately for the most part have been postponed till next year, not canceled. Um, so we hope that will pick up next year. Of course, who knows where this is all going, but we're all hopeful that there's a vaccine soon and we can all kind of get back to normal. Um, right. but, but just prior to all this happening, um, a couple of things going on. Um, 
I, I guess I could mention this, although it, there's nothing official. So the book came out um, just a little less than a year ago. And so we sold the, the, the movie rights to a um, executive producer, who I won't name, but who's a legitimate uh, established producer with, with a track record of making some films. Now that's no guarantee a film will be made, but everything is in place for that. So um, How exciting. Yeah, so I don't know what's going to happen with that. I'm very hopeful just because of my, uh, my uh, uh, certainty that, that <laughs> it's a fabulous story. Of course, I can't be impartial about that, but I mean, it just would make a great movie and apparently others think so as well. So we'll see if that happens. Um, and, and even if it does, that would probably take some time. Those things take a lot of time to develop, but that's kind of one project that I look forward to working more on. At the same time, um, I, ha I was working with um, a gentleman out in uh, Sacramento um, who, who was going to produce a, a, a one-man show, similar to what I, I told you about earlier, where I kind of do a scaled-down version of this rock and roll history show with an upright bass and two acoustic guitars. Mm. Um, so we, we actually were um, had booked a theater um, just outside of Sacramento, and we're going to film three days of concerts and then take that on the road. And of course, COVID-19 put the brakes on that. So um, I continue to develop that. And that'll be more kind of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a uh, very personal, you know, one man show where I speak to the audience and show, you know, several hundred photographs on a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, wow. Tell Sounds a lot of great. story and then uh, perform some of these songs acoustically. So, uh, so that's, that will be a great, a big project that we look forward to getting underway. Hopefully it's successful and it will lead to, um, you know, um, uh, extended runs uh, throughout the area. But, but everything was set for that. And unfortunately, um, the current situation has put all of that on hold. Yeah. You ever, well, do you, you, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, so do you guys ever get out to the Chicago area or anything like that? We, uh, you know, we haven't. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm sure we have been, you know, within a hundred miles of Chicago here and there. But, you know, um, unfortunately for us, um, the, the, our audience in the U.S. in particular is, is mostly people who were uh, young enough or old enough in the 50s to remember the music, you know, in other words. Now, there's a secondary audience who remember this music from Happy Days. But let's face it, this was 75 years ago when Rock Around the Clock first hit. You know. So our audience is getting smaller and smaller. People don't go out as much. It's a demographic that doesn't go out. So our opportunities have been dwindling. So I don't know what the future holds. Only the expectation is that if a movie is made, which I'm hopeful, that that will create a whole new audience and that sure. will uh, well, yeah. increase our opportunities. So I don't know if we'll get out to Chicago or not. Obviously, um, if anybody in the Chicago area is watching this and is interested in booking our band, I'm very easy to find. Um, they can find Where me can they find you, Bill? You yeah. at, you know, BillHaleyJR.com. Bill do you happen J to have a copy of your book, Candy? You could, have, you could hold I do. it up? I, I yeah, let's see. To. Just happened. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's see that. So, so Put that this, right uh, up to the camera. I want to yeah, see that. There you go. Close. Yeah, that that's was awesome. crazy this, and crazy. I love it. I love that. I love that. I love that. Uh, story. Um, it's on Amazon. It's in Barnes and Noble bookstores. Probably most places you get books. If they don't have it, they can order it. And um, this is a little different version uh, in the UK and around the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Same title, Crazy Man Crazy, the Bill Haley story. It's nice. a little different, some different photos. Edited slightly differently by the uh, the UK editors, but basically essentially the same story. Um, so it's, it's really available all over the world. And Amazon, you could just Google Bill Haley story, Crazy Man Crazy, Bill Haley Jr. It'll all come to. Wonderful. Well, Bill, Wonderful. what a delight to have you and to hear these fantastic stories from about your dad and. Your story too. I mean, is your story, let me ask you, is, is your story told from your point of view about your dad or is it a biography? How is that book? Um, that, that was a challenge because, um, I, I, you know, it, it would have been awkward to write in both third person and first person. So, um, so I wrote it in third person, but there are some personal parts. So, you know, the story is mostly about my father, his life, his career. Sure. And, 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 and um, relied very heavily on interviews with 
the women in my father's life, his ex-wives mm -hmm. and girlfriends um, that I was able to interview and his ex-business manager. So the story is really told from their perspective in the third person for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now, there are um, a, a chapter or two toward the end where I talk about my own um, okay. uh, attempt to, to develop a relationship with my father. And we didn't get into it in this interview. And, and it's not a secret, but, but it's kind of the, the tragic thing about my father's life and the book is that he did become a chronic alcoholic. And, um, and, and, and it led to his early demise at the age of 55. Mm -hmm. But it also created tremendous difficulties in terms of my, as a, as a son, trying to develop a relationship with my father. So I do yeah. talk about that in the book. Okay. Um, and, and, and it's, it's done in a third person, but it's really first person accounts. Gotcha. If that makes sense. So it yes. just to be the it makes easy. perfect it's, sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It, it does. sounds like a really interesting story and I would love to read it actually. I'm gonna get a book and perfect. get a copy. Yeah. So um, thanks so much for being with us and sharing all your stories. And we are just delighted to have you. And hopefully maybe in the future we can have you back on again and you could talk about your band a little bit too. That would be fantastic. Yes. Thank you okay. so thank you so much, Bill. It's really an honor and a pleasure uh, meeting you and, and talking with you. And it's just been a, a blast. This, this was just awesome. And uh, uh, before I depart, just want to let everybody know, check out DickBianniFilm.com. Be sure to like our Facebook page and join our Facebook group as well. Uh, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You should yes, see all the yes, playlists on YouTube that channel. channel. Thank you. You're going to like it. <laughs> yes, you're going to love it. Oh, there's great stuff on there. Yes, thank you, Pam, for reminding sure. me. Sure. That's right. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. This has really been fun. And um, we hope you enjoyed learning some of the old stories of rock and roll and Bill Haley and Bill Haley Jr. And go out and get that book. Sounds like a really good story. So... Okay, guys, be safe, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.